so back in the spring, we put up a little note on the web. Uh, it was a hopeful note. And it said, if you would like to build something that might be the DPLA, or a little bit of it, or a big bit, or a medium-sized bit, um, just start. Tell us by June 15th that you want to do it, letter of intent. And then by September uh, 1st, you send to the steering committee uh, your results. Please just send us a URL. And it can be big or small, or um, uh, code or not code. But the basic idea is uh, give us a glimpse of what this might be. And what we'll do is have a review panel of people who will review these on behalf of the steering committee, people without any conflict of interest among the um, uh, sprinters. Um, and then we will invite the most promising of those, according to this review panel, to present at the National Archives, which is where we are today. So we're going to have six presentations that are sort of full presentations. Each, pr each group will um, speak for no more than seven minutes, and there will be about seven minutes of uh, discussion with each one. And then um, our review panel also chose three for lightning round presentations. They'll go five minutes each um, sorry, together in a series, and then we'll have uh, uh, commentary for that group um, after that. I want to thank the Blue Ribbon Review Panel. They were wonderful. They came uh, to Cambridge after having done a ton of homework and reviewing these 40 submissions that were unbelievably great and rich. Um, and they spent uh, time locked in a conference room and came out with uh, recommendations that I think are fantastic. Um, they were John Weiss, uh, Patsy Baudin, um, Michael Santangelo, Maeve Clark, Eli Neuberger, Laura DeBonis, who I saw here today, David Rumsey, and Jessamyn West. So I'd like to have a round of applause for the volunteer group that did the reviewing. All right, so um, the first of the groups um, is one that was referenced earlier. It's called Digital Collaboration for America's National Collections, um, representing uh, three organizations that have uh, worked collaboratively together, um, the Smithsonian National Archives and Library of Congress. Um, Martin Kalfatovic, um, Chin Seng Wang, and Pam Wright are here to present. So over to you guys. John. Um, the main focus of our um, beta sprint entry was actually to show that actually these three large institutions could actually collaborate together. <laughs> so that was sort of the quick thing. And, and I think that's sort of the, the proof of concept that we did. So everything else is all sort of the, just the rest special sauce part of it. <laughs> um, so again, I won't, um, we've heard already some of the um, statistics of our different collections. And, and what we primarily did in this case was using some records from each of our three institutions, we put them into our existing Smithsonian's collection search project, which Shin Sing will talk about in a minute. Um, primarily to just to show how this different type of data from museums, archives, and libraries could all interact in one large data system and provide um, different types of access to the data. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chin Sing, who's going to talk a little bit about how we did this, and then you can ask some questions about the details. Um, I think Mark has uh, alluded to the fact that uh, we're using the existing Smithsonian Collection Search Center and extend it to the Sprint, um, beta, beta Sprint uh, project to see how things turned out. And uh, the three major organizations um, are participating, and we have all sorts of uh, interesting materials, and uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, this is something that we could uh, use not only for one inst uh, institution or interface, but for many. Uh, we started this project by uh, making sure that we have a dynamic, um, extendable uh, metadata model. And this is something that the Smithsonian has spent time reviewing all sorts of national standards uh, and looking for commonalities from among them looking for specialties anywhere from standard printed materials in MARC formats um, to scientific specimens, mosquitoes and little bugs, and uh, making sure that the taxonomy information uh, is properly addressed. So therefore, uh, looking over the national standards of various cataloging standards and ensure that the metadata covers all of the commonalities. And this is one of the examples, a tiny snippet of what the metadata model actually look like. And this particular section uh, addresses the geographical location of the tags. So for example, a photograph could be taken at a particular location, and therefore we could have latitude and longitude information, which later on can be used for searching purpose. A bug it can be collected at a particular location, so that this can help the scientists to track the migration patterns of a bug or a bird or a whale, uh, anything like that. So, uh, this is just a snippet of what the metadata look like. 
obviously, we have uh, great co cooperation from the three organizations. Uh, these, two, these two records shows the 11 records from Aaron's uh, National Archives. Uh, and uh, this was under a time constraint, so we did data manual uh, conversion from the National Archives and from the Library of Congress on the right. After we get those records, we ingested those records into the existing Smithsonian 7.4 million uh, records collections online environment. Uh, this is with the uh, existing mechanism, data ingest process, everything, nothing else has changed. And of course, as a result, we now have uh, the libraries, archives, and museum collections all in one place. The key element is that we wanted to make sure that everything gels together so that they're not separate, independent little dots floating around, but rather we wanted them to work together. So the higher level system architecture basically includes um, as you can see, that on the bottom, it represents data from various independent sources with specialized databases and focus. And uh, we, uh, each of the organizations, these large organizations, all have similar kind of a, a challenge. But the goal and uh, what we end up doing is that we allow the metadata model be the guide and standardize the data format and the data uh, it's, it's then ingested into a central index, uh, search index, or a temporary metadata repository. This is not permanent. This is purely for indexing sake. Um, in coupling with the concept, then, we allow several web services to, um, for example, uh, to use the data. Uh, for example, metadata delivery service is focusing on searching and retrieval of the textual information. The, on the right side of the screen, you will see an index uh, image delivery service, and that is for the purpose of doing manipulation of indexes, uh, uh, images, zooming, and uh, resizing. And finally, the tagging service is to allow getting public input and letting people tag our materials. With these three services, then, uh, we allow people to start developing their own uh, web interface, mobile interface. So by no means that this is a single interface or uh, architecture. I don't have a whole lot of time, but this is a high level system architecture. Our processing uh, goes through starting from, from the bottom up. You will see all of the databases. It gets ingested into a raw index in this holding place. And then between, uh, you will see a little uh, box go up and down the arrows in the middle there. It's a pre-processing stage, and that is where we do extensive scrubbing data, standardization, making sure that data coming from different sources actually conform to certain standards. And then we push that into our master index. And the master index then gets replicated into a number of slaves to handle high level of traffic. At this point, the data has no particular phase until some web applications start to happen. You see the red line, dotted line, that indicates the firewall. Outside of the firewall is when a number of applications can be developed. And uh, I will end there for questions. Hello. TJ, and um, I guess my, my question would be how often in sort of the, the final <laughs> implementation, how often would that indexing happen? Like would it be sort of a one time per record thing or would that be, you know, uh, updated as they changed as they might change. The stuff. answer is um, at different intervals. Different organizations, with, uh, for NARA and Library of Congress, so far we have only done one time, uh, but I'm sure that if we uh, progress down this road, we can negotiate a refreshing schedule. For internal Smithsonian, we range from daily updates to weekly to monthly to quarterly. It all depends on how often the data is refreshed and updated and also how often uh, the organization who are contributing the unit feel that they can handle on their side. But the system is built in such a way so that it's accommodating all levels of frequency. Good question.
Gary Simmons, National Archives. Um, I'm the team lead for authority cataloging, and I'm interested to know how you got these data to interact. Um, the data, um, obviously, the system part actually is not difficult to build. And uh, ultimately, what really grew, glue everything together and have the data start interacting, it's really through the metadata themselves. And I think that the catalogers, uh, professional catalogers, are the people that we need to thank them for. Um, the data, if uh, obviously the, the three organizations that we happen to be dealing with all use uh, um, at least the internal uh, standards, if not national standards. So we have the benefit of taking advantage of uh, AAT, Sosori, um, and uh, architecture, uh, uh, art and architecture, Sosori, uh, LCSH, uh, name, subject, headings. All of these terms are ultimately very important. However, when we talk, about, and I mentioned that there was a lot of data scrubbing process, the data scrubbing really is to standardize terms. Uh, there are t times it's uh, uh, just simply misspellings. There are t other times that are just way too detailed levels, and we just match those terms up to the national standards, and we flip them from there. And we have a database that's de designed to do just that kind of th thing. We identify um, exceptions, and we identify what to flip the terms to. And uh, we have right now about uh, probably 50,000 lines of exceptions that we process through to scrub the data to make it standardized. Once the data is standardized, then the records naturally start interacting with each other. Uh, Jerry McCann, University of Virginia. Can you speak to uh, the kind of traffic that you have to expect if this becomes uh, the platform for DPLA? It's a gigantic um, upscaling of the amount of traffic you can expect? Um, okay, that's kind of a hard question to <laughs> uh, answer. I don't have the numbers uh, on hand. However, um, the Collection Search Center, which is a main uh, website that uh, retrieves uh, content uh, by the, from the end users, we have in the neighborhood of um, probably about 25,000 uh, uh, unique visitors per month. However, um, for we have this, as I mentioned, that this system is not built for one interface. We have, um, we have web applications using uh, the data. We also have individual, five different individual web applications using uh, the data. Uh, we have actually two mobile applications, each with a different focus accessing the data. I don't have their statistics, but I know that um, majority of the traffic actually come from those other applications other than the main one that we provided. So in other words, you know, um, if some, if uh, DPLA uh, takes off and the local towns wants to write their own application to tell the history of their town or a particular story of their culture, they can really draw on a lot of uh, materials from other organizations. One example I like to point out is that Smithsonian has a well-known uh, uh, American Indian Museum, uh, and they have wonderful collections. Uh, but uh, out of pleasant surprise, they have found out that Natural History Museum has an anthropology department uh, which has tremendous amount of collections that uh, they find it extremely uh, supplemental, useful. And also there is a National Anthropological Archives that the Smithsonian has that has even more uh, cultural and um, language materials that they find it useful. So they are all these pleasant surprises that uh, before we didn't realize, and now um, we find it good. Thank you. Please thank uh, Jamie and thank you.